Welcome back. As far as micro brands go, Zealous is always a company to keep an eye on, as they're consistently putting out one great watch after another. And last month was no different, as there was a lot of talk and some reviews on the new version of their Hammerhead Diver. Yet they also very quietly released another watch near the end of the month, and that was the third version of their Mako Diver. While the Hammerhead is a bit of a beast of a watch, with its rather rugged angular case that sits at 44 millimeters, the new Mako is a bit smaller at 40, and it's much more classically styled, with a bit of a smooth streamlined case. It also has a rather interesting dial, and this particular video on Instagram is what really captured my attention, and that was a few days after Christmas. They refer to it as a fume dial, with a Whirlpool galoche texture. And it was after seeing this footage that I contacted Zelos and asked if they had one available, as I would just love to get some great detail and macro level shots of this thing, just like I did with the Swordfish. But because of the holidays, I didn't hear from them for a bit. But when I did, they actually told me one was already on the way. So I do need to give a huge thank you to Zelos for giving me this watch. Now the bad news is that about a week after I got it, that they'd completely sold out of all of them. And I'm not really sure when they're coming back. And this really isn't that surprising. With a Miyota 9015 and a pre-sale price of 369, this was kind of too good to last. So if you happen to have ordered one and you're still waiting for it, I think you're going to be very happy with it. But for everyone else, I do think this is one to keep an eye on, as it is a pretty good watch, especially if you're looking for one of those elusive smaller divers. In many ways, the Mako is really the opposite of the last watch I reviewed, which was a Seiko Dark Knight Turtle. Where there the focus is on a larger case that surrounds a smaller dial, here the focus is all on that dial and the bezel. The case is 316 stainless, and the finishing is quite good. It's entirely brushed and rather smooth to the touch, with the exception of the polished beveled edges on the lugs that are there just to really define the overall case shape. However, that edge isn't just on the top of the case, but there's also one that runs along the bottom. And it just helps give the case an overall thinner profile. Looking at the left side, you can see that the 40mm bezel goes right to the edge of the case. Yet the overall width is more like 40.6. And this is due to the case just protruding slightly out on the right side as it comes down to the crown. Not so much that it makes it look asymmetrical, but just enough to create a small notch to protect that crown. And I really love how they added a chamfered edge to that protrusion. Again, not just on the top, but also the bottom, which just gives it a really smooth and streamlined look. The screw down crown isn't very big, but it protrudes just enough so that there's never any issue when you want to use it. And with the crown, the overall width is only 41.4 millimeters. So it's still pretty narrow as divers go. There's also a pretty narrow lug to lug of 46 and a quarter. So overall, it's really a smaller footprint, which I think makes the watch wear just a touch smaller than you'd expect, probably similar to a 39 millimeter. Yet because of the way the case is designed with just so much emphasis on the dial and the bezel, I think it still has the presence of a 42. By utilizing a Miyota 9015, they were able to keep the case thickness down to 11 and a half millimeters. But they then topped it off with a rather large domed crystal. It's a 2.5mm thick box cut double domed sapphire crystal with AR coating, which just looks brilliant, but it does increase the total thickness to just over 14mm, which sounds and is kind of tall, but it is important to remember that that's just at the very top of that crystal. Otherwise, everything on the Mako is pretty standard. You have a 300 meter water resistance, 20 millimeter lug width, and a weight of 165 grams with a bracelet. Without, it's more like 95 grams with one of the other straps. So overall, it has a great solid feel to it, but it's not overly heavy. Now back to the crown. Here you'll notice that it's not only signed, but it's also loomed, which really is a cool touch. Now this isn't the first loomed crown I've run across. That was the NTH Takuna. But here I think it's done better, and part of that is because it's a much more generous application of loom, but mostly it's due to the 4 o'clock crown position. On the Takuna, it was there, but you really didn't notice it much. While here, that crown is mostly pointed directly at you, so it's something you see all the time and can appreciate. 
but I do wish that it was lined up when it was screwed in. Here it looks more like an N than a Z. There is also a closed case back on the Mako, and it's probably my biggest nitpick when it comes to the watch. It does have a nicely embossed Mako shark in the middle, but there's nothing really surrounding that shark, and I think it looks just empty. Worse, however, is that the edges of the shark, as well as the edges surrounding that whole medallion, are a bit sharp. It's something you can feel as you run your fingers across it, but that's not something you regularly do, so I'm not going to count it against the watch too much. But I do feel that the quality of the case back here is kind of a letdown when you consider how great the rest of it is. The bezel is exactly what you want it to be. It's 120 click, unidirectional, and very minimal amount of back play. It also has the perfect tactile feel and sound as you rotate it around. Now, there are six different colorways of the Mako 3, each with a different degree of panache. This version is the Midnight Blue, and I think it's probably the most subtle and maybe classically styled out of all of them. As such, it does have a dark blue ceramic insert to it, yet there is a ton of loom applied to that insert. Almost to the point that the green glow coming off it occasionally makes it look more teal. And that leads us to the dial, which is this gradient or fume blue, where it has a dark navy blue center that then fades out to black as you go out to the extremities. It also has a sunburst effect that's then further modified by that whirlpool texture. Now, different people are really going to react to this in different ways. Some, I think, are just going to be weirded out by looking at it. Yet others are actually going to love it, and I'm definitely in the later camp, although maybe not for its intended effect. If by the end of this review you really love the watch, but just really hate that texture, do know that there are two different colorways that don't have it, yet they're also interesting in their own right. But the other four are going to express this to different degrees, and in that regard I think the Midnight Blue is also the most subtle. Where here, in bright light and full daylight, you really see that whirlpool design. It's just very apparent. And it is pretty cool in its own right. Yet any other time, you just get bits and pieces of it. And it's really that partial effect that I really fell in love with. Where you're just getting a hint of it across the dial, and the entire thing just seems to sort of shimmy and glimmer subtly. And it really just reminds me of staring down into deep water. It's really subtle, but I think it's an effect that really sets the Mako apart. The indices are applied, and they have a decent height to them, but nothing spectacular. Yet the metallic framing and the white loom centers really offer a clear contrast to the dial underneath it. Most of the indices are dots, but they're pronounced arrows at the 12, 3, and 9, which gives the entire design a crosshair effect, just drawing your eyes to the center of that whirlpool. There is a date at the 6, with just a simple cutout, but there is a matching date wheel, and I think that combined with the texture on the dial just really makes it blend in nicely. The hands are lance-shaped, and while I do think they are the perfect length, they are a bit narrow. Yet if they were any wider, I think they would distract from the dial underneath. But regardless, I've always found them just really easy to read, especially that yellow second hand as it sweeps around. Now, overall, I really love the design here and the layout, but there is one big negative, and I think it is actually the biggest complaint I have against it, and that's that it can be a bit reflective at times, which is really just a combination of the dial and the domed crystal. I mean, no matter how much AR coating you put on a crystal, it's really hard to stop a domed one from just redirecting all the light towards it, and this is something you can clearly see on an overcast day. Yet, even with that reflection, I think there's enough contrast with the dial underneath it that it's not too hard to read. Now, originally I was actually a little concerned about the loom here, since it's a much smaller watch than the swordfish I looked at previously, but those concerns were unfounded, as Zelos just really did a superb job here. They actually used X1 grade Super Luminova, and the results are fantastic. Not only does it look great with a combination of green C3 and blue BGW9 loom, but it's also pretty long-lasting. Now, you have my standard turtle here, but do pay attention to how it compares with its bigger brother, the swordfish. After a four-hour test, both watches are barely visible. Yet, while the Mako's hands are maybe just a little bit weaker than the swordfish, I think the dial is just as strong, and the bezel might be a little bit better. So I'd say it's just as good as the swordfish, 
But what's really impressive is that the surface area of the hands and the indices on the Mako are a lot smaller than the swordfish. So I think Zelos did a great job here. Movement wise, we have Miyota 9015, and it is a step up from the Seiko NH35. It's a 28,800 beats per hour high beat movement, and it does have hacking and hand winding. Overall, it's a great choice, and the only downside here is that the rotor is a little louder than some would like. Yet even with that, I do like the 9015, and I've been pretty impressed with every watch I've had one in. And this is no different, as I've only been losing 2 seconds a day since I've had it. The Mako 3 comes with a Tropic rubber strap, as well as a vintage Horween leather one. But there is a bracelet that's available for extra, I think it's like $49. And there really is a legitimate argument there that it should come with it. But either way, Zello sent me all three of them, and I'll give you a rundown of each. First we have the bracelet, and it really is a great bracelet, and honestly it's easily worth 50 bucks if not more. It has solid end links, a great milled clasp, and a really, really nice finish to it that matches the case beautifully. It's entirely brushed, except for the sides of each link that have a chamfered edge to it, which I think just lines up perfectly and leads it up to the same on the lugs. Yet as good as the bracelet is, I actually preferred wearing it on the two other straps. Because of the way the end links are designed, the first link does extend out a little bit from the case, which I think kind of effectively increases the lug to lug. As the watch did wear just a little bit different on the bracelet, it always felt just a little flatter. At least compared to the straps. Now the Tropic rubber strap is just that. It's a great simple strap that hugs your wrist perfectly. Yet if it wasn't for the signed buckle, I think it would look a little generic. Which leaves us with the dark brown waxed Horween leather. And this one actually became my favorite strap. Not only does it look great with the watch, but it's a pretty good leather as well. However, it is pretty stiff to start out with, and I'd say it took a good three days before it really broke in. But after that, I really love how it wore on that strap. And it's a great combination with the brown leather and the blue on the dial and the bezel which just helped the watch sit right where it needed to be on my wrist, and just gave it a great presence, but in maybe a slightly smaller package than other divers. And lastly, let's talk value. Now I do think these were pretty much a steal at their pre-sale price, but at this point that's long gone, and when they do come back, the price you're looking at is more like $449, which overall I still think is pretty reasonable, and it's actually a pretty good deal if you wind up comparing this to some of the more premium micro brands like say NTH or Notice, where there you're going to spend more like 600 to 700 for a watch with a 9015. Yet this still might not be quite as good as some other watches out there, and some of those I've looked at and some I haven't. But the one that immediately comes to mind would be Phoebus' Bronze Eagle Ray, which actually has a Solita for a little bit less. And when you do start to compare the Mako to other watches in the market, one thing I think that does hurt it is that it doesn't come with a bracelet and you do have to pay extra for it. Although even without the bracelet, I think the Mako is one of the best divers I've ever seen, especially if you're looking for something a little smaller. Now over this review I've basically just nitpicked a few things, but the rest of the watch is pretty awesome. Overall I really think this is a complete package. It's got a great finish, fantastic dial, and superb loom all wrapped up in a beautiful looking watch. One that I think you could easily wear out to dinner, as well as the beach. So this is definitely a watch I'd recommend you keep an eye out for when they do come back. But let me know what you think about the Zelos Mako 3 down below, or if you can think of any other watches this size I should take a look at. And as always, if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Thanks for joining me.